You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome. I'm Kenneth Bomo. On today's show, we'll discuss the challenges facing Nigeria's microfinance industry. You can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets and you can follow my Twitter at Kenneth Bomo. Now, mixed reactions have trailed the decision of the Central Bank of Nigeria and the Bankers Committee to set up a national microfinance bank. We have Rogers Mwoke, he's the president of the National Association of Microfinance Banks, and he joins me to discuss the challenges facing the industry. Liquidity for microfinance banks um, is a problem because um, though microfinance banks are licensed to take deposits, there is um, no linkage program that makes microfinance banks have exclusive um, deposit collection for people that they serve. Okay, so all over the world um, where microfinance bank is practiced, uh, people either run the banking model of microfinance or the non-banking model. Now, in the banking model, a microfinance bank is a bank with everything that a bank does, except that it is restricted to the size of transaction, which is the concept of microfinance. Okay. Now, if you are running the banking model that we are running, it means that every microfinance bank licensed by the Central Bank of Nigeria is a bank and should therefore do everything that a bank should do but targeting at a particular um, customer base and so restricted by Russia. So what has happened is that there is um, no clearly defined market lines. So you find out that on the liability side, um, micro, uh, commercial banks are playing from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So you have savings products for a child born today, a child that will be born next year, as long as you can open an account. Um, the smallest um, um, Nigerian who, um, in his vocation or trade, managed to save 200 naira a day, 200, there is a program for him. But that person does not have access to credit from the bigger banks. Now, his access to credit should come from banks that are serving the bottom of the pyramid. And now, because of this concept or this uh, perception of uh, security, perception of uh, my bank is strong, yours is not. So if somebody has the choice to put his money in a big commercial bank and in a small microfinance bank, he naturally will put his money in the one that is perceived to be safe. Now, when the person now needs money, you direct him to the other side. Now, in other climes, let's take, for example, India, there is a sectoral allocation. Microfinance uh, institutions in India do not collect deposits, but there is a minimum of 11% and a maximum of 19% of credits by commercial banks in India to the microfinance institutions. So because you have access to these funds, then you are able to deliver services. Now, we started microfinance banking uh, in the middle of some kind of crisis because before even the microfinance policy was launched in 2005, all manner of institutions have been in the place parading as microfinance banks, one-man shows, cooperatives, and all manner of things. So when they took people's monies and disappeared in thin air, everybody saw that to be microfinance bank. And so you came in at a time when reputation was already bad so nobody wants to put money down. Then too, you look at the model itself. Now, when we started microfinance banks with 20 million capital, if you read the policy document, the whole idea, that model was supposed to be, with 20 million, they can set up their offices. But there was supposed to be a microfinance development fund. Now, the microfinance development fund, the, the, the policy actually says, there shall be established uh, I'm lawyers will tell you that when you say shall, means it's mandatory. In other words, this policy was supposed to survive, exist, be sustained based on the establishment of this fund. Okay. Now, nine years after, that fund was nowhere to be found. Now, when the um, administration of uh, Malam Salusi Lamido as Governor of Central Bank came in, they tried to set up the fund. Now, what happened? Rather than set up a microfinance development fund, we now set up the MSME Development Fund. Now, by moving away slightly from microfinance and saying MSME, MSME it opens up. A lot of it opens up. Are. So commercial banks came in. Um, Two billion was given to each state government to also carry out microcredit. So at the end of the day, today only five percent of that fund 
exactly. has been given to the microfinance bank. Okay, very interesting that you mentioned liquidity as a major, major challenge facing them. But I'd like to take it to the next level here because I understand that the central bank gave microfinance banks 18 months to show up their capital. Yes. You know, I'd like you to speak to this and, you know, what are the challenges you are being faced and, you know, what are the possible outcomes and how, how this would impact the, the, the microfinance ecosystem in Nigeria. Okay, um, first, um, we at NAMB will believe that having licensed microfinance banks, I mean, by the policy in 2005, with 20 million and looking at the impact of inflation and everything that's happened, 20 million definitely um, is no longer an adequate capital base. So, um, but we had quarreled with the how did you determine the move from 20 million to 200 million, and we think that. So are you saying there wasn't enough consultation to get to this new figure? And, and, and no, we, we were not consulted, but we have made our uh, position known um, to the Central Bank of Nigeria, and they have been talking to us. So some um, level of uh, consultations you know, have taken place, and um, we believe that uh, something is being done about it. We are not opposed to recapitalization, but we've raised a few issues. One is that the jump from two, 20 million to 200 million um, makes it extremely very difficult for some banks to survive. And the reason is simple. Now, for a microfinance bank operating here in Lagos, here in Victoria Island, for example, or you could do anywhere, will probably be able to have a market to absorb a capital of 200 million. A microfinance bank in somewhere in a village in Adamawa or in my village in Imo State will probably have nothing to do with a capital base of uh, you know 200 million. They have to. So we have asked that the central bank should tier you know, um, um, this to have, if possible, rural microfinance banks with a different capital base. So if you increase from 20 million to 50 million and the bank is operating in my village in Imo State, it's probably going to do well. Now, if you also ask, you know, um, uh, that same bank to take 200 million, you know, they will not. And we think that uh, April next year is such a short uh, time to meet up with that. So we agree to recapitalization, but we do not agree to the quantum leap. We think it should be done. Um, rather than wait for 10 years, 8 years before you review the capital, you can review the capital every 5 years, every 4 years, and then let us begin to grow it. Okay, you know, small. Yes. okay very interesting. But I'd like to still on, on still getting liquidity in that, in that system. Yes. You know, what, what, have been, what has been the story for the MFBs playing in the capital market? And are you looking to see more in listings on the capital market? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, Consequent of, uh, upon the announcement for recapitalization, um, the association will have um, approached the Nigerian Stock Exchange and we are already um, discussing. I think there is another meeting uh, before the end of this month to see how the listing requirements um, can be tailor-made to, to suit you know, um, microfinance banks. We've reviewed um, the, all the listing requirements, both even for the second tier market, and we see that uh, some of our members are going to have even some challenges coming there. And I'm aware that the stock exchange is also keen to bring in um, a, a, as many more players on the market as possible. Um, currently, um, two microfinance banks, uh, you know, we are listed. Um, NPF, you know, is still there, and, and, and Fortis. We want to see more of our members get listing on, on, on the exchange because we know that there are um, investors um, who believe in this market, but um, entry barriers, you know, seems to be a problem. And if we are on the capital market, that will be, you know, easy to go in and uh, out. And then it also will bring a lot more transparency because um, when you are on the market, your reporting requirements, you know, increase. You have to, uh, you are now in the public uh, domain. So a lot more microfinance banks will be able to um, be a lot more um, transparent. People could see what, what, what is going on there. Um, you now have more regulator than central bank. You are now under also the um, regulatory supervision of SEC um, with regards to your uh, public listing. And also we are hoping that uh, before the recapitalization is over, some microfinance banks will come yeah. to the market. Interesting you mentioned regulation because I would like to, you know, get from your, your feedback from the regulators. You know, what are they you know, what are the, what's the major challenges facing regulating microfinance banks in Nigeria? Well, first, let me say that um, we, we are all for regulation. We believe the market, the, the business should be regulated. I think the biggest challenge um, hearing the regulator speak is the sheer number of uh, microfinance banks. Until recently, when some licenses were revoked, there are 1,028. Okay, today we'll probably have about 885. Um, regulating that number of uh, companies Okay. In addition, um, 
to several other financial institutions that come under the re regulatory purview of one department at the central bank um, is really, I believe, a daunting uh, task. They, they've been doing um, a lot of work to share as well, but I think um, the sheer number of uh, microfinance banks is a major challenge. All right, then. Yes. then when I look at broadly at the, the microfinance or the financial services space, we're seeing, we're seeing what's happening in the disruption is taking, taking course across board. We're seeing the, 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 the type of customers you have are changing. You have more millennials and they are, the way people are trying to reach them is a bit different. How would you say the microfinance banks are coping with the disruption in the financial services space? Okay. Yeah, most microfinance banks too are, are, are getting caught up in the web of digitalization. Um, we, we, we know that many of our members are transforming their services also to provide digital financial services. Um, the fintech companies are always um, welcome, but I don't think that the banks are under any form of uh, threat. Um, the business we do is uh, access to credit mainly uh, to people and um, giving loans is a judgment. It's not what computer can do you know, for you. Uh, we still believe that um, getting to the grassroots, having a face uh, you know, towards the business that you do is equally important. We, we advise our members, no matter how digital you want to be, no matter how much uh, automation you're achieving, don't um, let your computer, your, your customers see just the computer. So the human uh, part of it makes the business um, we do. We, 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 we do not think that um, financial services will get to that point where everybody just goes to his computer and gets a loan. Um, 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 we are yet to see it work perfectly um, well like that because there are things you cannot put in the computer that determine whether a customer pays or not. But some will argue that you know, with the, you know, the, the development in anal analytics, automation, you know, it's the Internet of Things, all that is making that, you know, that, uh, that, that, that blockchain, for example, is making all that decision making happen at a much faster rate. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it is. But we still, let's not forget that we still have our problems. Um, in the UK, US, anywhere, you can approve a credit for someone based on his credit scoring. Now, how do you do credit scoring for a trader in my village? Do you understand? Beyond well, the, we have credit bureaus, but that also is another part of the market that still needs a little... Yeah, little yes, but the, cre yeah. the credit bureaus today is probably getting data from banks. Now, in Lagos, you can get data probably from your landlord to know those who are paying their rent or not. You can get data from um, the telephone companies for those who are paying their bills, for those who are post and all that. But in the rural areas, how much data can you fit in to make decision for people at the bottom of the pyramid? I think we still have a lot of work to do. The, 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 the decision inputs that are required to touch these people at the bottom of the pyramid require a whole lot of person-to-person -person engagement. I've been speaking to Rogers Wonke. He's the president of the National Association of Microfinance Banks. If you're just joining us, Rogers Wonke, the president of the National Association of Microfinance Banks in Nigeria, is with me today, and we're discussing the challenges facing the microfinance industry in Nigeria. Let's look at um, concerns raised by the central bank on you know, the operation of uh, microfinance banks in Nigeria. I'd like you to address maybe a couple of them. Yes. For one, you talked about the um, operating expenses yes. being above even that of not, not natural, not normal banks. Yes. How, what do you have to say to this? Yeah, basically, uh, um, we're all traders in this space. Okay, um, The way somebody is buying uh, bags of cement and selling, we, we're all traders in the financial service uh, space. We're trading with money. So your weighted average cost of funds determine you know, the pricing at which you give out money. And when we have a situation where somebody does one big ticket for 100 million naira, okay, so if I have to deliver the same 100 million naira to say about 2,000 or 100,000 um, um, people, it's more expensive, it requires a lot of work to do. But fundamental to that is my source of funding. Many microfinance banks today are surviving from fixed um, deposits from people, uh, net placers, people who are uh, prepared to take a, a lot more risk. Okay, so commercial bank probably pays you 10, 11 percent, and a microfinance bank can pay you 14 or 15, so you'd rather put your money there. Now, that's not a sustainable 
uh, uh, means of funding. So I also don't think that intervention funds, as we have them today, um, is also a sustainable way. What we want the, the central bank to do for us is to create a level playing ground, you know, an enabling environment that allows social investors, microfinance investors, to put money into the place. That's, that's how we can move faster. Um, 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 intervention funds are just a handout. They, they are not enough. 220 billion MSME, uh, MSME DF is, is, is a small thing compared to a 9.6 trillion gap in MSME uh, uh, funding needs and other. So I think that what we should do is make the environment attractive for people to come in here and bring in cheap funds. Make it attract. For example, why would the policy, uh, uh, the PENCOM policy, for example, forbid pension funds from being invested in microfinance banks? Interesting. Now, this is a long term fund that can help the sector develop. Okay. Why are we restricting certain funds from going to the microfinance space? Okay, very interesting. I would like to also even get, get that from the CBN as well. Yes. But we'll, we'll, we'll investigate for that and, and I'll <laughs> definitely get back to you. But then, still on some of the issues the bank, the, the Apex Bank raised, yes. talked about exorbitant interest rates for micro, microfinance banks. How can, how, why is this so and how can we make this better? Well, again, what I said is, I mean, very high cost of funds leads to high pricing. But first, I think maybe... Um, you push have fact checked. Um, what I had um, the governor say was that if a microfinance bank lends you fifty thousand, before you collect it, they charge you another fifty thousand. Maybe there are other sets of banks, but for licensed microfinance banks under our association, we have checked there is no microfinance bank in Nigeria that lends fifty thousand as principal and collects fifty thousand as interest within the six months period that we lend money. Okay, so. When, if that was defined as outrageous, um, I, I would say that it's not my members, okay? However, I agree that our cost of funds, our pricing is higher than that of the commercial banks, and it's purely a situation of economies of, say, of scale. Um, if, if it costs me uh, one million naira to run my business, and I have a 100,000 customer, another institution that has one million customers, that would translate to smaller units of that cost per customer. So it's a question of scale that we are doing. Now, how do we do it? We need to make liquidity available to the microfinance banks as cheap. Look at what's going on um, in the commercial banks. They have so many zero-priced funds, and we don't have. Well, but even the commercial banks will tell you that the operating environment is not as, as, you know, as, as, as much as they would like it. But how is this operating environment impacting uh, the microfinance banks? It, it's tough for everybody, but I'm saying size makes somebody probably takes it on a lot more than a smaller um, you know, person. So generally speaking, um, the operating environment is tough. There are several issues. Everybody probably runs his own generator. Um, everybody uh, pays all manner of taxes. Um, even at, at microfinance banks, you rent a, a business, you have gone to get um, um, Corporate Affairs Commission approval to set up your business. You have to pay the local government um, uh, permission to operate a business that you have registered uh, properly under the laws of the land. You put your signage outside, you have to pay for it. Um, you, 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 you're supposed to get electricity and you don't get it, so you put your generator on. The local government comes back to charge you for gaseous um, you know, emission. You know, all manner of things you know, put together makes it extremely very expensive for somebody to do you know, business. But I'm saying that the war chest is bigger for some people and smaller. So the bigger guy probably takes it in a lot more. And because um, you have 1 million customers, 2 million customers, when you spread those costs on a per customer basis, then the cost of serving one customer becomes very, very small. Now we are operating at the micro level with probably some, some microfinance banks have 5,000 customers, 10,000 customers operating for a place. So when you spread, spread those costs um, to the individual customer on a per customer, basis, you find out that the cost of uh, providing that service is higher than uh, your colleague in the other okay. side. Okay. This next question is, I want you to give me the truth, Okay. you know, as it is. What came to your mind the first day when you heard about the National Microfinance Bank being set up? The truth. Yes. I, ju I just said, not necessary. I thought um, that wasn't a solution. Um, I thought, I just said, why are they doing this? I thought that what is appropriate for anybody to do was to look at how to 
get microfinance banking working in Nigeria to solve the problem and not to set up one um, you know, microfinance bank. So many things came to my mind. Um, for example, the, the, the National Microfinance Supervisory Guideline says you cannot start with a National Microfinance Bank. You're supposed to start either as a unit or as a state and then grow to become a national. And then here we are licensing one as a National Microfinance Bank immediately. You know, so many things came you know, to my mind and I'm asking myself, is that the best way? But what we did too was to um, put our thoughts down and approach the central bank and said, we don't think this is, you know, what um, you will do. And we hope that, well, I guess it's late because the bank is already there. Um, I know sometime this week it will be uh, fully launched and um, come into operation. So it's not a question of whether to do it or not to do it. I guess it has it's already, already come there, to stay. Yeah. So the question will be, what next? For us, what we'll be asking is, let the playing ground be level. This is one bank. Let it also be one of the microfinance banks in Nigeria. Several uh, government and quasi-government institutions have also opened their own microfinance banks in the past. It hasn't hurt um, uh, business. Um, we continue to do business together, compete where competition is necessary, collaborate where collaboration is uh, necessary. Which is what, exactly what I think the point is, is trying to complement the efforts of already existing microfinance banks. Yeah, yeah. That's, if, if, if that is what it is, then that is, you know, fine. That, that's not the impression we got originally. So what we're saying is, yes, let us collaborate. So as long as I expect them, for example, to immediately come and register as a member of National Association of Microfinance Banks because the, the, the CBN document uh, that regulates us says every licensed microfinance bank in Nigeria shall be a member of the Apex Association. So I expect the, the, the NISAR Microfinance Bank to immediately come um, on board to become a member of NAMB, otherwise they'll be in violation even of the policy itself. Okay. So beyond this, what, which other areas of conflict do you see? No. Or the, contention? No, no, no. The, 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 when I still talk about level playing ground, the, the intervention from the Axmis Fund, for example, that uh, was said to be available, rather than give it to them, I would rather that you put it down so that any other microfinance bank that meets the same criteria will have access to that intervention fund. It, it will not be proper uh, to say, oh, because this is bankers' committee, it's our money, um, we're backed by the central bank. So you give them all the funds that come probably at, uh, the cost, at, at a single digit cost, while I source mine from you know, the, the, the private sector at commercial rates, and then we're expected to play together. So I would like all of us to play on that same level. And then it, where there is, again, where there is competition, let us compete. Where there is need for collaboration, let us collaborate. Okay, but when you look at the model that has been put out there, it's going to be working in collaboration with NIPOS yes. to, to, uh, to help meet some of the hardest, hard to reach areas you know, in the country. What do you make of this model? Yeah, I, I, I still think that there are existing microfinance banks at those remote places. Today, there's a post office in my village. It's not working. Now, if you are coming to convert that place to a bank, you need to do some work. But there is a bank, a microfinance bank, in that same place. Why don't you think of how to support that microfinance bank to provide the same service than coming all the way to convert a post office you know, to a bank? Again, it, 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 draws, it, it draws me closer to think, have we given up hope with rejuvenating our postal system. If we're going to confer these things to branches of a microfinance bank, what happens to our postal system? Because technology has not taken away the need for postal services. Okay, that today in the UK, you can actually have your passport sent to you by the post. You could get your PVC sent to you by the post. You could get your driver's license sent to you by the post. What happens today is that if you want your driver's license, after you do data capture, the day it's ready, you're going to go to the uh, collecting center and queue up. These are things that the post office could do for us. I think we should first and foremost bring the post office back to life. And then it can become agents of... Uh, um, um, uh, banks and uh, other financial institutions. Finally, looking into the year, we're looking at things, interesting things playing out in this, in this space. We're seeing, you know, banks, microfinance banks trying to get more capital in there. We're seeing elections coming coming up, and then how do, by how much do you think all this would impact the growth of, you know, a lot of the microfinance banks in Nigeria? Well, I believe strongly that um, um, the, the future looks a lot brighter. 
um, with uh, recapitalization coming in, I can tell you um, from my privileged uh, position that a lot more interests are coming into that sector. And, and it's funny that the bank we're talking about um, is said to be owned by the Bankers Committee. I can tell you also that many banks who are members of the Bankers Committee are also working to also have their own uh, you know, microfinance banks, either um, wholly owned or interest. And so what is happening is a whole lot of attention is coming. And with new capital coming into the sector, microfinance banks are going to be stronger. Microfinance banks are going to be um, a lot more active, um, um, bracing up to new challenges, coming up with new initiatives. There's going to be a whole lot of innovation, you know, coming into that place. I've been speaking to Rogers Moke about the challenges facing Nigeria's microfinance industry. And that's it on Beyond Markets, and thank you for joining us. Remember, you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West Africa time daily and have access to all previous episodes of Beyond Markets on our website at cnbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets and follow me at Kenneth Igbama. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.